Great. Good afternoon, everyone, or at least this afternoon here uh, in uh, the UK. Uh, my name is Karen Smith, and I'm a professor of international relations at the LSE. I'm pleased to welcome uh, you all to this panel on feminist uh, foreign policy. We have four excellent and experienced uh, speakers. Um, I'm going to first briefly introduce them. Uh, we will then start, start they'll start by um, uh, answering a particular question on uh, what is uh, feminist foreign policy, and then we'll do a follow-up uh, round of questions, and then we will open, um, open the Q&A uh, to questions from uh, the audience. So please use the Q&A function uh, on uh, the Zoom um, uh, 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 website in order to ask any questions. So today, I'm very pleased to have uh, first of all, uh, Ambassador Sophia Kaltrup, who is the Ambassador for Gender Equality and Coordinator of Feminist Foreign Policy for the Swedish, Foreign, Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Then we have Dame Judith McGregor, who uh, uh, was a former British High Commissioner to South Africa and also uh, retired from the British, service, uh, British Diplomatic Service after 40 uh, years there, so considerable experience. Uh, then we have, uh, joining us from, from Canada, we have Mariam uh, Monsef, who uh, is an activist, but also a former cabinet minister uh, for social and economic uh, justice. Uh, and then uh, finally, we have Nina Bernarding, who is the co-director of the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. So four very distinguished and experienced uh, speakers. And the question that I'm going to pose to them first is, what is a feminist foreign policy? Um, how should we best understand uh, a feminist foreign policy? Is it revolutionary? Is it radical? Or is it just uh, a little bit of tinkering uh, around the edges? So I'm going to ask each of uh, the speakers in the order that I just presented them to give their views uh, on that. So over uh, to you, Ambassador Kalto. Uh, you need to unmute. Sorry. Thank you, Karen, for that very interesting uh, question and a uh, great pleasure for me to take part in this seminar. Uh, Sweden was the first country in the world to launch a feminist foreign policy eight years ago. So coming back to your question, what it is, in, uh, in that situation, we had to very much invent it. It was a very clear uh, signal from our then uh, foreign minister, uh, Mrs. Uh, Margot Wallström, that Sweden uh, was to be the first country in the world to, uh, to, uh, to uh, pursue a feminist foreign policy. And we actually spent quite some time in the ministry back then to, to grapple what this would mean and what it would entail in terms of concrete action. So in short, we had to be very uh, practical about it. Uh, we spent quite some time looking at uh, the various areas in which we work, trade, development, cooperation, security policy, and really asked ourselves what would uh, a feminist foreign policy or a gender lens applied to those policy areas look like. And a wide range of consultations took place within the ministry and we came up with what we call the method of the three R's. And that is uh, when we look at the foreign policy question, be it uh, security, be it uh, trade, uh, be it uh, anything, we look into how women's uh, rights, representation are, and resources are affected. That is looking at uh, how uh, women's um, rights are respected and we often find that women's rights are less respected than men's, that women are discriminated against uh, across the board. Uh, then we look at the second R, that is representation. And of course, um, I think that's known to all of us that women are, uh, are largely unrepresented in, 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 uh, in, uh, in forests where decisions are made, be national parliaments, be international institutions or in peace negotiations. The third R is resources. And um, uh, looking at, at this R, we look into to what extent women uh, have access to the same type of resources as men, 
one very good example uh, is gender budgeting uh, when looking into 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 the budget of an organization or a, uh, or a country that we give development aid to to what extent is the is the gender is the budget uh, uh, gender uh, gender um, sensitive so with those three r's rights representation and resources we, we really try to, in each and every instance and context of foreign policy, uh, look into how we can uh, steer our action and, and um, tailor our uh, foreign policy uh, uh, response in a way that women, uh, that women and girls are, uh, are, um, are more respected, that their rights are more respected, that they are represented to a larger extent, and that resources are more equally uh, uh, divided. So through this uh, method, which uh, we now have worked with over the past uh, seven years, we we really try to be context specific and look into what the feminist foreign policy uh, mean in each and every uh, specific situation. So uh, coming back to the question, what uh, what feminist foreign policy is. Uh, for us, it's of course a goal in itself because uh, we see that women are discriminated against and women are underrepresented in, 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 in all forums where decisions are made. But uh, it is of course also a prerequisite to address today's global challenges. If we do not involve the women, if we do not empower the women, uh, we will not be able to, uh, to, uh, to solve the acute crises that we see today, be it the situation in, in Ukraine or be it climate change or anything else. Simply put, uh, uh, we need to involve half of the world's population if we want to find solutions. And, uh, and uh, therefore, in our view, uh, a feminist foreign policy is, is, uh, is a practical tool, but it also is a um, necessary perspective in order to, to, to contribute to concrete change in, in today's global landscape. Excellent. Thank you very much. Very good. Um, from, the, from the pioneers of uh, feminist foreign uh, policy. Um, uh, next, over to Dame Judith. Great. Sorry, I just couldn't get it unmuted. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to focus, I think, Karen, a little bit, not just what it is, but what does it look like in practice? Um, following on from Sophia's very helpful introduction. Um, I mean, I see it in, in, if you like, in definition, be a policy which really elevates and coordinates efforts to institutionalize, to some extent, gender equality and women's empowerment as a foreign policy priority in the areas particularly of development, but not just, but also in defense, diplomacy more widely, trade and economic empowerment. So fairly broad and wide ranging. One of the things I think, however, that um, I would like to pose as a question really is the extent to which yet um, a feminist foreign policy is so substantially different in, different in practice from what I would call a pursuit of gender equality and women's empowerment more widely as part of a more global foreign policy with many other aims and objectives. I think it's a legitimate challenge. I think in reality, it's, um, it's the same thing looked at from another side. But I think the feminist policy, um, foreign policy would seek to go a bit further. I, I mean, Sophia says a goal in itself, but also a, a means to, um, to take forward other um, challenges and deal with those um, solutions. And I think that's absolutely right. Um, for example, the UK does not claim itself to be like Sweden, Germany, Spain, or some others to be pursuing a feminist foreign policy. But we have pursued gender equality extremely hard for at least a decade, um, institutionalizing it in a legal requirement in our development policy. And mo most recently, particularly in the fields of education. We have absolutely majored on women and girls' education um, in our development policies. We have also absolutely majored on helping to protect and empower women in terms of their sexual and reproductive rights, also in their, their various choices there, but also in their health more generally, pre and 
postnatal um, health. So that's been a really big part of our development. And then more widely, and more recently, perhaps, I think, you know, the G7 summit, which happened about a year ago in the UK, um, really did take this whole thing a, a leap forward in my mind. Um, not only did it make its gender advisory council a permanent feature of its summits and asking them to absolutely review both papers and outcomes and with policy mandates in between, but they absolutely went into trade policies, how trade policies can affect the economic position of women. And of course, we've been looking at for some time now, a decade, an initiative which was kicked off by the UK, but really taken up worldwide on com of combating sexual violence in conflict. And we have a conference on that, I think, coming up in November. Um, and that's 10 years of really sustained efforts. So I suppose what I could be saying is, we're doing this already, but we don't call it a feminist foreign policy. Um, but I don't think, but I think equally, that's maybe a sterile question, because actually, I think it's really important that we do harmonize and bring together all of these activities. And I think the feminist foreign policy for my money has given an extraordinary sort of focus and impetus to these issues, which otherwise could be one of many in a broad, broad horizon. And secondly, I think it has also motivated people to really think about the nature of international institutions, how they are put together, um, the, the makeup of them, the range of the issues they should address, and of course, the position of women. But so it's both in my mind a means, but also might have qualitative impacts on diplomacy more widely. But you asked, Karen, were there some risks? Well, there are some risks, I think, or put it like this, there are difficulties. We'll come on to the challenges. But certainly, the numbers of women who are in a position more widely than a few European countries to really pursue this through the mechanisms in their country or internationally is still quite modest. It's growing, but it's still quite modest. There is a potential danger, I think, in labeling a policy to have one particular sort of focus when. In diplomacy, you need to have a very, very wide range of partners um, and you need to be bringing people in with an aptitude and an interest and a willingness to compromise and to dialogue. And one could say that that's not necessarily the case in very conservative societies who might find a feminist policy not necessarily something that they would wish to do because of their own domestic policies. And then I think there is also the reality that in many ways, the position of women has become more difficult just in the most immediate period internationally with the impacts of COVID, 13 million more people in poverty, the majority of which are women and children, the numbers who couldn't go to school, women still not being able to get onto the internet, women still not studying STEM at universities. So there are many, many issues that do need to be addressed. So I think it's been, it's given a tremendous stimulus and focus and some objectives which are qualitative but I think most of all, it's really opened out a big panorama on gender equality. And that's something I would really like to extend to other marginalized groups and people, not necessarily a gender issue, who could also be taking part in the foreign policy debate more widely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so another more, you know, again, we're hearing, I heard more on representation uh, as well there, which we can obviously pick up in uh, questions or in discussion. Okay, so next on, thank you very much. And next on to uh, Miriam. Thank you, Professor. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, and I agree 100% with Dane Judith. Um, it's, you know, a feminist foreign policy in Canada's case, a feminist international assistance policy was a big deal uh, when it was presented. Uh, I remember the day it came to cabinet, the leading minister, Marie-Claude Bibeau, was presenting this inspiring vision for Canada's place in the world, inspired very much by pioneers like Sweden. Thank you, Sweden. Um, and, you know, motivated by the feminist movement in Canada and globally. And the feminist international assistance policy in Canada was coming in the heels of 10 years of a government that took the word gender out of foreign policy, that slashed feminist related budgets significantly. 
Uh, today, we're commemorating missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Canada. For the previous government, this was not a priority. So to have a feminist international assistance policy in Canada was a big deal. And when we announced it, it was well celebrated, but it was a step. It was an important step. It ended up leading to, you know, a dominoes effect where after the feminist international assistance policy, we saw significant funding allotted. Uh, our development department, international development department changed the way it assessed grants and applications. And so accountability measures were put in place. And then we sat there and said, wait, we're doing this in our international assistance policy. What if we did the same thing at home domestically? And out of that came gender budgeting. It's enshrined in law now in Canada. Uh, we upped our game with gender-based analysis plus. Uh, we have an ambassador for women, peace and security now who Jacqueline O'Neill, if you haven't met her, she's wonderful. And she's working on our uh, action plan for women, peace and security. We followed the lead of UK, Italy and others, and we streamlined gender into our G7 meetings uh, in Charlevoix a few years back with feminists at the table speaking to G7 leaders like Mr. Trump about where their priorities needed to be. And then of course, a feminist focus on our COVID response. So it made a big difference putting women and girls at the center and saying, women and girls have the power to change the world, but it's not enough. And certainly we see in today's context, in places like in my ancestral land, where the Taliban just walked in and undid 20 years of progress, hard won gains for women, children and minorities and just undid them all. There's even more relevance for feminist international uh, assistance policy and feminist foreign policy. And I will say this, governments don't just wake up one day and say, you know, we've, we've done a lot of harm to women and minorities. Let's step it up. Let's do better. No, policies and priorities like this only happen because people push for it. So what is a feminist policy? First of all, the women and those who've come before us persisted and they were relentless in asking for it and they moved it forward. Second, it put women and girls at the core of policy. In Canada's case with the Feminist International Assistance Policy, Marie-Claude Bibo, who should be given so much credit for this, I played a supporting role. She traveled, she talked to 15,000 people, she took insights from 65 different countries before she built this uh, policy. You know, she said the primary, at the core, it will be women and girls empowerment, but our primary focus has to be economy, it has to be poverty reduction. Uh, and, you know, the, the last thing that I'll say in terms of the nuts and bolts of Canada's international assistance policy, it's divided into six priority areas, human dignity, inclusive growth, uh, the role of women in climate action and environment protection, inclusive government, as well as peace and security. But yeah, if there's one thing I could say is, you know, to, to leave you with, now more than ever, we need to step it up because for every step of progress we've made on feminist policy, in Canada's case, like with the feminist international assistance policy, there has been strong backlash from those who do not want to see this kind of progress. So the work has become even more important and even more challenging post-COVID. Great, thank you, uh, Miriam. Uh, also for those uh, those um, warnings about the backlash. Uh, now over to Nina. Nina. Thank you, Karen. Um, and yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, so from our perspective, or from a civil society perspective, a feminist foreign policy is all the interactions that a state or an international organization does with other states, um, with other movements, with civil society, with international organization, in such a way that it really disrupts power structures with the goal of making everyone secure, um, while it recognizes that individuals and communities have different security needs. Um, so 
if feminist foreign policy really shifts the focus from the security of the state to the focus of the individual um, as the primary referent of security, um, that means that not the, the state itself or the institutions or the regime or the state legitimacy is the subject of the concern, but it's really the, really the us, everyone, um, the individuals, and in particular, the marginalized communities. So including women, but also um, people of color, um, people with disabilities, um, uh, queer communities, and so on. Um, so in order to, to do so, a feminist foreign policy is always informed by the perspective and the needs of those most marginalized communities. And we do not advocate for a blueprint for every state to adopt a feminist foreign policy, but we, alongside many other civil society organizations, um, rather advocate for certain principles that need to be um, involved in, in, in any feminist foreign policy. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them, but I'm just going to list some which I think are very important. Um, so first of all, it must be intersectional. So it, it must consider how identity markers such as race, class, or ability sexual orientation or gender um, intersect and affect the lived experience um, of, of people, and in some cases create new and more concentrated circumstances of oppression. Um, a feminist foreign policy is also anti-racist and critical of the influence of white supremacy in the field. And I think this is very important, in particular when we talk about international um, cooperation, as we call it, or international assistance policy, as it was just named, um, to reflect also on colonial um, um, aspects um, of foreign policy. Um, a feminist foreign policy is coherent in its approach, so that it, it must be um, coherent in terms of what a state does internally, but also externally. Um, and then I think what is very important is, given that um, a feminist foreign policy really focuses on the humans or feminist security, um, is that it's anti-militaristic. So it prioritized the pursuit of feminist peace. Um, and for example, a, a feminist foreign policy in our um, understanding does not go hand in hand with um, being a nuclear armed state. Um, so, so to answer your question in the beginning, is it radical or not? It depends on, on where you're coming from, I think. I mean, to an extent it is radical because it really asks to reflect on how our institutions are built and whom are they serving and what is the goal. But on the other hand, if you just consider that our goal is making everyone safe, that's not radical at all. So I would rather say it's it's radical to question um, why it's necessary. And um, so I would agree with my uh, with everyone that um, they was speaking before me. It is a mean to its, its uh, it is a goal in itself, but it's also a means to achieve a more stable and more peaceful security. Um, or international um, system in, in general. And I would just also add that um, that it's, it is a new concept and we are really grateful for Sweden for basically trailblazing the way and showing that a different way of foreign policy is possible. Because I think at this, in 2000, back in 2014, um, I think also former ministry, uh, Minister Wallström ha had said this uh, previously um, that it was met with giggles and the Swedish government was was laughed at and no one really knew what it meant. Um, and I think it took a brave, um, it took a lot of um, yeah courage to actually do this. And we're really grateful for this. But just to say that feminist ideas in international relations is not new. So we have seen it in for more than 100 years um, um, that feminists are arguing for a different approach to, to foreign policy. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll leave it here uh, for now. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Nina just uh, mentioned giggles um, uh, greeting uh, the announcement of a feminist foreign policy. And I now want to ask each of our panelists to just perhaps just in the interest of time, um, list sort of what you think is the major, the most um, important obstacle to the implementation of a feminist uh, foreign policy. I mean, I know there are many, um, but what what do you what would you kind of put at the top of the of the list of those main obstacles? Um, and we'll just go in the order, um, in the original order. So um, over, over to you, Ambassador. Um, thank you, Karen. I think uh, that is an interesting question. And as was mentioned, uh, when Sweden, when we launched our feminist foreign policy, this sort of giggling was, was something that we ourselves, I mean, was reflecting upon. And I think um, the sort of, uh, for, I, I, and I agree with a lot with uh, what have been said, and, and especially Judith's comment on sort of how 
to what extent the feminist foreign policy is something else than than uh, uh, foreign policy that that uh, that looks uh, specifically into gender equality. Uh, in a way, I mean, we talked about the backlash, the polarization, which are of course. Uh, the big challenges, but I would say that one of the main challenges is possibly uh, to have uh, uh, other, to have other states and people realize that this is not something very radical, but very much a sort of um, uh, 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 that a feminist foreign policy makes sense in uh, in uh, in uh, if we want to solve the today's global challenges, as we have talked about, we need to have an include inclusive perspective we have the concept of i mean the broader security concept that that uh, that people have alluded to and and uh, and 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 um, and to have um, in a way demystify a little bit what a feminist foreign policy is i would say is the main challenge it is i mean it's about basic rights anti discrimination involving half of the population uh, in in uh, decision making and 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 uh, global problem solving and to to, uh, to, uh, to, to, um, to demystify and make sure that, uh, that this concept is not uh, seen as something um, extreme, I would say, is possibly the main challenge today. But we are making good progress. That's also what I want to highlight, that we have now today uh, 10 countries that have uh, formally adopted a feminist foreign policy. More and more are joining. I participated um, two weeks ago at a very successful event that we hosted together with a number of other governments in the margins of the uh, of the uh, high level week of the general assembly and to see how such a wide uh, range of states and groups talked about the importance of of a gender perspective in foreign relations and that we need to to involve the women if we want to solve the global challenges of today that was very very um, encouraging so um, a lot of challenges, but also a lot of progress. Positive, that's a very positive view. Right, over to you, Judith. Sorry, over to you, Judith. Thank you very much. I'll get the hang of it eventually, doubtless. Um, there are so there are so many challenges, and rather like Sophia, I think you know I'm going to not just stick to one, but I'm also going to sort of say how I think they can be turned into opportunities, because I think otherwise um, it's uh, it's not actually it's not an accurate picture either. So obviously one of the biggest difficulties is just not having, if you like, enough women in enough places to make a difference. I mean we've undoubtedly found that where we have had women ambassadors um, or have linked in with women NGOs uh, who are very focused on the gender sort of angle, then you really have seen progress and, and, you, and consistent progress. But, you know, only a quarter of perm reps in the UN are women. Um, we have some actually amazingly at the moment, some of our top diplomatic posts, about 70% are women. But whether that will continue when you look more widely, um, our numbers are not so are not changing so very fast. But I do think when you bring together women from different countries and from lots of different professions, as for example, this G7 Global Advisory Council that I was reading about, and I thought it was amazingly impression, impressive, led by lawyers and people in other walks of life, then I think there's really um, a receptive audience worldwide. And I think we need to, to bring that much more into um, our feminist thinking. Secondly, I think, a big problem is that there have been more conservative movements in some parts of the world. Um, Marianne mentioned obviously Afghanistan, but there's also been more populist governments coming into Western European countries and female empowerment is not their number one priority and indeed there can be sort of opposition to that. I think though that what a feminist foreign policy does and, and I think the countries that are doing it are setting that out very sensibly is it can set some goals and it can set some targets and it can set some real ability to measure and to provide evidence. So we are already beginning now to get evidence to show more women peacekeepers, that the, con the conflict in sexual violence is beginning to impact the number of armies signing up to it, the number of legal instruments. This is really impressive. Also, 
it does make sense if you stop and think about it, that more women are skilled up and can bring and contribute to the growth and employment in their countries. And that evidence is coming in all the time. So I think the sort of the regional effect of conservative some, conservatism sometimes can be rather powerful. When I was in South Africa, we found that South Africa was beginning to be more conservative in some human rights issues because of its affiliation to and part wishing to be part of Africa and the African Union, which was taking a more conservative view on some things. But with our advocacy, with, in, with women, politicians, with particular people, we were able to, I think, make some progress there. And finally, yeah, the media. The media either really ignore this issue or they're a bit negative, aren't they? So it does seem to me that sort of with the sort of tee hee hee, this is all sort of rather funny. And I do think that sort of those countries, particularly who are espousing a foreign, a feminist foreign policy, but the rest of us are also doing um, the same thing in a different way with gender equality and bringing on diversity and inclusion. That we really need to bring the media behind this to tell the good stories and more evidence and more, I think, cases that show that this makes a real difference to climate change, to sustainability, to everything that we're so preoccupied by, then I think that will really take us forward. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Mariam, over to you. Thank you, Professor. Um, I'd say the biggest barrier is that there will always be negative forces who do not want to see women in charge, whose primary agenda is keeping women out of power to erase women. We see it here at home in Canada as well as around the world. And that backlash will always come to progress. Uh, that's inevitable. There was backlash when we got the right to vote. There was backlash when we entered the workforce. And there's sure as hell a lot of backlash as more and more of us attain positions of power and influence. Just look at any one of our Twitter feeds and see the garbage that comes up in opposition to us. So accepting backlash, accepting that there are negative forces who don't want to see women succeed, I propose that there are five pieces in honor of sustainable development goal number five that ought to be in place to push back against the pushback, to manage the challenges. First one has been mentioned, it's political will. It matters who's in charge. In Canada's case, it mattered that we had a feminist prime minister. We had a feminist foreign minister, Chrystia Freeland proudly, you know, wears her Jepral feminist t-shirt at Davos and in all sorts of places. It mattered that Marie-Claude Bibeau was in development, uh, in the development sector before she became a politician. The leadership matters. At the top, it matters. A finance minister willing to put money into these policies matters. It helps push back. But I'd say the most important piece in a democracy, and I believe strongly in democracy, at a time like this when it's under attack in all sorts of ways, these big policies, and they are radical, they are courageous, as Nina said, we need the support of the people, the will of the people. So first of all, the push has to consistently come from the outside to keep doing better, to step it up, that this is the right way. Yes, there is pushback, but that's part of the noise. There's just as loud of voices on this other side, encouraging you to move forward, decision makers, keep going. The next piece I'd say is communicating progress. And, and Dame Judith mentioned, you know, talk about, hey, look, peace is more enduring. Climate solutions are more evident when women and girls are involved. But communicating that progress and results in a creative way at a time when there's so much noise for people to sort through, if that is done well, that changes culture. The next piece is reward governments who take the big leaps and the big risks. Hold them to account, but President Obama said, he said perfectionists, uh, he was talking about progressives. He said, progressives are perfectionists. We eat our own. You know, if there's one little piece missing in a policy, we just say, nope, this whole thing is awful. We're walking away from the table, do better. Um, never let 
perfection get in the way of progress. And I think that's something on all of us activists and feminists to be more mindful of, especially in this uh, environment. And then the last thing that I'd say is consistency is required. Nina, you know, when Canada started, we weren't intersectional in our response. We, the plus in our gender-based analysis plus often got forgotten and it took us years to step it up and we're still not there, right? The anti-racist approach is still not fully formed. So in order for policies like this to yield the results that people say, hey, this is a good idea, they have to consistently stay relevant and become better and better over time. Only then we can push back against the ever-growing forces wanting to diminish and erase women. Great, thank you very much, uh, Mariam. I particularly like how to push back against the pushback. Uh, and Nina, over to you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mariam, I just wanted to say, I agree absolutely with you. And and um, we also, at, at CFP, we also emphasize that we know that we're running a marathon and that this is our long-time vision. That doesn't mean that we would never, I mean, we're always supporting governments that, that try to do smaller steps first because we also know you can't have a feminist utopia tomorrow um, but we do think it's important to highlight where we want to get at some point point. Um, in terms of the biggest challenges I mean a lot have been said um, has been said so so I will just focus maybe on on our work and that's actually fundraising its finances um, what we've seen is that and I think specifically in the case of Sweden we have seen that it made, makes a huge difference if you have a feminist foreign policy or not where the funds are being spent. Um, and I think this is something which we would like to see from more governments moving forward. Um, but in particular, not only what where the money is spent, but also who's who's receiving the money. Because we know from, I think, recent research from the International Center for Research on Women that showcases that only 2% of all the funds that is actually earmarked for gender equality reaches feminist and women's rights organizations. And But we know from, from history that Feminist civil society is the main driver for social change for the better, in particular when it comes to marginalized communities. Um, and yet we are receiving so little funding. And this is in particular in stark contrast to, and it has been said a lot, the, the backlash. We don't call it the backlash anymore. We call it the anti-feminist or anti-gender movement um, because we've realized that it's, in our understanding, it's not so much about the, the rights that have been gained for women or LGBTQI individuals and communities, but it's rather being used as a mean um, to generate power and to mobilize in elections, for example. So it's, it's I don't think most of the anti-feminist actors actually care about the rights of women or the rights of queer people. They just see it as a, as a good idea or as a good opportunity to mobilize um, against something or or for their, um, for their power. Um, so um, they, there's a lot of money in the anti-feminist movement and Open Democracy has, for example, done a lot of research on this, um, how a lot of money, for example, from the US, but also from Russia, and but also from other parts in the EU is being spent in the EU to, to change um, EU laws, for example, but also to um, online harassment of, of activists and so on. So there's, I, I think the problem is still underestimated and I think it, we always stress the importance that it not only touches upon the rights and the lives of, of marginalized communities, but it also threatens our um, our entire international human rights architecture. Um, so I think these are the two main challenges that I would like to, to put out for now. Great, thank you very much. So we have already got <clears throat> quite a good list of uh, questions. I'm gonna try to summarize a couple of them, um, a few of them, and, and sort of I'll, um, I'll give each of the panelists the, sort of the freedom to decide which of these they would like to, um, uh, to, to take up. You don't have to uh, address all of them. There are at least a couple of questions that mention anti-militarism, uh, which is kind of building on what Nina also said in her sort of definition of feminist uh, foreign policy. Um, to what extent, you know, should, must a feminist foreign policy be anti-militaristic, and then how would that be kind of put into practice? Um, um, I mean, if I'm going to put in a critical word, I would say I'm not quite sure the Ukrainians on the ground would want um, necessarily not want us to help um, with military assistance. I mean, how do you deal with those kinds of questions about the role of military, of the military in a feminist foreign policy? That's sort of one one kind of set of questions about that. Another very interesting question, who come, uh, which is coming from uh, a professor in the LSE School of Public Policy, who was also deputy minister of foreign affairs in Mexico. 
And her, her quite question, her, uh, you know, a very important question is, okay, does this depend only on the government in office? In other words, it can change, right? So another government comes in, like you were saying, Miriam, you might have a completely anti-gender um, a government and then an another new one. How do you kind of make this, embed this so that it isn't destroyed by, shall we say, populist authoritarian uh, parties uh, in uh, government? Um, there was also another question of another uh, professor at the uh, LSE, Chris Alden, who uh, I know writes on foreign policy, who wanted to ask about the cultural relativism and what a, whether a feminist foreign policy is Western. The extent to which it's Western or perhaps beyond uh, Western. So I can see that my panelists have already eagerly put up uh, hands to answer the, uh, answer the questions. So I'll go in the order that the, that they've done so. Um, so you can kind of pick and choose from these questions what you'd like to uh, concentrate on. We've got another twenty minutes uh, for discussion. Sophia, over to you. No, thank you very much. Extremely interesting question, and I would like to address, I mean, the uh, issue of anti-militarism and also possibly the issue of cultural relativism, relativism, because I think, uh, I mean, um, I have a lot of sympathy. Uh, um, I think that uh, Nina uh, highlighted the issue of, I mean, can we have a feminist movement uh, that is, uh, for example, um, uh, a nuclear power, etc. And and, and I think from a state perspective, uh, it is important to remember that, I mean, we pursue a feminist foreign policy, but we need to do that in a reality. And the world looks as the world looks. And I think that we should not, how do you say in English, you know, the, 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 the perfect should not be the, uh, uh, should not be the, uh, the enemy of the good, because obviously uh, a feminist foreign policy that is pursued by governments need to take uh, realities into account. And the work of a government uh, in foreign policy is, of course, to constant balance different interests, uh, uh, etc. So um, we, we need, to, I think, in order to, to uh, and we have now seen a movement when more and more countries are, are, uh, are um, adopting a feminist foreign policy, they put on the gender glasses, uh, which is great, but but um, of course we need to realize that it's states, and states need to make, of course, uh, always uh, uh, compromises in what type of policy policy um, uh, uh, alternative to pursue. And to f so for us uh, to pursue a feminist foreign policy does not in any way contradict that we, uh, for example, export arms to certain countries. We have quite clear uh, guidelines for, for our arm exports, which involves looking into the situation of, gen of women and girls, et cetera. So, so I guess that what I'm arguing for is a bit of a realistic approach when you look into the issue of, of uh, feminist uh, foreign policy and issues such as uh, militarization, because we need to be realistic. We live in, in a world where, uh, where we need to do as best as we can and and not let our high sort of ideals be the uh, I mean the the perfect be the enemy of the good and that links a little bit into the issue of cultural relativism because um, each and every country that pursue a feminist foreign policy I think uh, should uh, and have to do that uh, based on its own national experience which means that the feminist foreign policy of Sweden um, we look very different than one of, uh, I mean, Mexico, uh, we have uh, Chile now adopting a feminist foreign policy. I have had extremely interesting discussions with Liberia that have a fantastic uh, national experience when it comes to involving women in their peace and reconciliation process, which I think would contribute immensely to their foreign, foreign policy if they would uh, would uh, decide to adopt a feminist foreign policy. So, so it is an interesting question, and I think we really need to make sure that it, it does not become a question by stressing the importance of linking a feminist foreign policy to your national and domestic gender policies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nina? Um, Maybe I can just add um, on, on the question of if it's a Western concept or not. So if we see who is driving the international debate on intersectional feminists, it's not white feminists, right? Um, so it is not a Western concept. And we've seen, for example, also Mexico adopting a feminist foreign policy. So I would just um, caution against the notion of that it's a Western concept. And and I mean, we don't need to look that far. We, we um, oh, I mean, 
we can see it in, in all places. We see in Afghanistan that women are standing up for the rights. We see it in Iran at the moment. So yeah, I can just repeat myself, but it's not a Western concept. And I think there's an inherent danger of, of, of creating this notion. And then um, to what um, Sophia, what you said, um, of course, like our work is embedded in, in, in the reality of today, um, but also, when we talk about the reality, I think it's also important to look at, and I know you know that, so, but like, I need to obviously uh, contradict what you've just said, but like, to look at the research that, that shows that um, if there's a higher level of gender equality, then a state is also more peaceful. Um, but the reality also includes looking at that um, nuclear weapons is a threat to humanity, it's a threat to our climate and to our um, nature. And I'm not saying that, uh, um, for example, the UK should give up the nuclear uh, weapons tomorrow, but I think there are certain steps that could lead to a nuclear free world. And if we are looking at who is driving the the movement for the treaty on of the prohibition of nuclear weapons, it is mainly countries from the global, global south, right? So we also need to acknowledge that there is a power imbalance in that. Um, and for example, for us, we again obviously advocate for an end of arms exports, but we also recognize that that won't happen tomorrow. So as a first step, for example, we advocate for taking the risk of gender-based violence being facilitated with exported arms seriously, and then in a long-term step, advocate for an end of arms arms exports. Um, we've always said that it's it's a short-term, really important um, tool to support Ukrainians also with military equipment, but that doesn't mean that we can just continue the way that we've built our international system. So once this war is hopefully soon over, we need to look at how we got there in the first place. And I think with the nuclear weapons, for example, I think it's a very dangerous discussion. We have President Putin who threatens to use nuclear weapons. And it's very hard for me to understand why then not the, the immediate response should be after the war is over or even already now we should work towards eliminating nuclear weapons everywhere but it for some reason the, the conversation goes into then we'll need to have more or germany for example is giving up the plans um, of getting rid of the u.s stationed nuclear weapons in germany because of uh, putin's threats and it's just really hard for me to understand why we continue to go um along with the same narrative that brought us into this mess in the first place Great, thank you very much, Nina. Powerful, um, powerful uh, voice there from the uh, the activists on the outside. Uh, uh, Judith, over to you. Thanks. I mean, I think my colleagues have have have, have answered very fluently on that. I mean, the, the whole point about sort of is to avoid conflict and to prevent conflict and to repair or help countries and areas repair themselves and and recover from conflict. Um, Many, many conflicts, too many conflicts are in the same places again and again and again. And that's where we're really sort of falling down, I think, and not, not being able to do enough. And I think some of the things that are going through under the badge of feminist foreign policy or gender equality or um, in the use of um, more women peacekeepers and so on has all already begun to contribute to that. So it's not just that, but it is very, very clearly that. Uh, the question about what happens when a new government comes in, well, as we've seen everywhere, new governments like to come in and have new policies and new initiatives, um, and that's their democratic right, and they've usually campaigned on that basis and, as it were, got the legit legitimacy behind that. So, if you like, that's always a risk for any policy at any time in countries where there is that changeover of governments and administration. But I think the way to, but, you know, interestingly enough, I mean, in the UK anyway, um, you know, we've had several different governments in since the beginning of really a very considerable focus on gender um, and gender um, equality. And, you know, it's just carried on and under a conservative government, it's got even stronger than it was before. So there isn't necessarily a sort of a trite way of saying one party will do this, one party will do that, at least in this particular context. Governments don't like to waste money electorates don't like to have money wasted overseas and they also like to feel that we have in most cases a values foreign policy so i think in many ways feminist foreign policy or the gender equality ticks those those boxes because it has by far been shown with extensive co consultation and surveying and discussion and debate that 
bringing in more responsible women into the equation in terms of economic empowerment or health um, determinants or education is a very, um, if you like, effective as well as being a more efficient way to try and remedy some of the development, the great development issues that face these countries. So I feel that, you know, provided that there is a good rigorous focus on evidence, data, what works and what is right, because people also want a foreign policy that, that links into their own values. And this does take give and take, and it does take discussion. And I think the you know, we've discussed before, Karen, the risk that, you know, if you say a feminist foreign policy, is that a bit exclusive? Is that just focused on women, by women, for women? Or is it something a bit wider than that? And I think everybody on this panel would argue it's much wider than that. It's a marathon, it's a long, it's a long journey. But the aim is not to have just a sort of reversal of the situation so women are on top, men are on bottom. Um, you know, it's basically to make this a more equal, and the word equality is incredibly important in this, um, and not just for gender, but in all other protected minorities. And I think that um, women, women and uh, can do a lot. I mean, you know, our daughters, our, our sisters, our, um, our friends, um, you know, they are people who in their own national societies can get behind these initiatives and form the networks and really explain them better um, rather than be passive watchers on. Um, you know, I think that that's really, really important. You know, it's, I can't remember who it was. Somebody on the panel said, you know, join the organization, be part of it. You know, political leadership is important. And I think that's just got to be sort of what we've got to do. It's a long journey. It's a long journey. Um, a goal is quite distant still. I think a goal is kind of visible. Several goals are visible, but the journey is still long. Cultural relativism. I sometimes suspect that this is just brought up as a smokescreen to sort of say, so don't do it, um, you know, because it's just Western sort of um, bossy boots telling everybody else what to do. Um, and certainly we've had in, in over the centuries lots of Western sort of policies which have just been sort of, as it were, imposed. But I do think that this is one clear area where, you know, um, women and people who want to extend equality in so many parts of the world are really, I think, coming in behind this agenda and seeing it as being a very natural and right way forward. And so I think that provided that, you know, as ever, that we co-design policies, that we co-think and that we really do try to work this through in a very international way, then perhaps that charge will be, um, you know, sort of something that absolutely can't be demonstrated because it's, it's, um, it's, it's really not just one place's policy. This is about, I think, ultimately, um, a, a better way of running our, our, our world. And, you know, sort of nobody, I think, around the place thinks that the way that we do have our international institutions constituted and the way that we do things is perfect and nothing needs to change. I mean, on the contrary, I think we see um, balanced and responsible and reasonable and well-discussed change is really, really important. So I think, I hope that this is something which um, evidently is um, not just happening from the West. And of course, Libya, I think, is a country that most recently, and we've mentioned Mexico, I hope other countries will, will join in or continue to do exactly the same work, um, very much in harmony with this. If, if I may. Miriam. Yeah, Miriam, um, over to you. At the core of this work is respect and reverence for women. And I use the term woman broadly to include all women, including gender diverse folks. So, you know, somebody asks, what can we do? How do we make sure that the next government prioritizes women? Like first and foremost, respect and reverence for women has to be at the core. If you respect women and girls, then you believe that they can be powerful agents for change. And on the comment about, is this a Western phenomena? I'm doing my master's right now at Trent University in Canadian studies and in indigenous studies. And one of the things that I'm learning is that pre-contact, pre-colonization, many societies in Canada, indigenous societies in Canada were matrilineal. The women were in charge. So the fact that women are subjugated is very much uh, the result of colonization. And, and that was a big, big moment for me. Um, the number one most effective way to advance gender equality is by investing in women's organizations. I learned that from 
badass feminists around the world, including in Canada, and the sustainability of the women's movement in Canada became my number one priority, and it paid off. When we gave those women, not very much in terms of investments, but when we trusted them with money, they came through for us. When COVID hit and we had no idea what to do next, those trusting relationships allowed us to pick up the phone and say, what do we do next? And they all said the same thing, despite all the way we feminists disagree, these women said the same thing. You're going to be forcing folks into lockdown for the greater good. That's fine. But just remember, not every home is a safe home. So make sure that the last door that a woman experiencing violent, violence and abuse knocks on is you know, open, is safe, it's well staffed. That became a message we heard from across the country. So we were able to get money into their bank accounts very quickly and they delivered for us. About a million women and children in the first year of COVID in Canada had a safe place to go to, to escape violence and abuse because we trusted those women's organizations and they trusted us with their time and their feedback. So you wanna help? The number one most effective way to advance this work is to invest in women's organizations. And then how to safeguard this work to make sure that we don't end up going backwards when there is a change in government. First of all, make sure there's a political price to be paid for a government that, that disregards, disrespects, or undermines women. Second, data. Anchor your work in data. Once those facts are out there and on the table, Feminists and our allies have tools to fight back against these anti-feminist movements. Inspire the next generation of feminist leaders, including men and boys, because we need them at the table making these courageous decisions. And show that it's good business. For me, you know, I spent six years as a cabinet minister, and when that time ended, it took me a while to figure out what do I do next? I started a business focused on supporting women leaders who are exhausted and overwhelmed from all that's come their way post COVID. And that's my way of contributing to the work, not stopping the work because I'm not in government anymore, but moving it forward. And my focus is showing that when women do well, families thrive and our economies and our democracies are stronger. So if around the world, we're all saying the same thing, and making this feminist work, good business, smart economics, I think that the work won't take 130 years, maybe 50 years. Okay, well, great. Thanks very much, Shamira. Nina, did you want to come in when, um, Nina? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to some other questions in the chat really quickly, um, and I try to be within one minute. Um, they were just a question of if men are equal, of course, so yeah, I'm not gonna say more to this. Um, it's not called a women foreign policy or a female foreign policy, it's a feminist foreign policy. So yes, women also in power can make really poor choices, um, but we would still argue that women have the same rights to make poor choices than men, but what we want to have is feminist in power positions, right? Because that will lead um, to, to um, change. There was a question on, on, on cooperation, and I think specifically linked to international humanitarian aid or cooperation. Yes, a feminist foreign policy always needs to be informed by those that it's impacted, that impacts. So we always encourage governments to have really consultative processes, not only at home, but also abroad, because foreign policy decisions mainly impact people abroad. Um, and then on whether or not a feminist foreign policy can be fickly for governments. Of course, I mean, I think anything can be a fig leaf, but what we, the experience that we've made with all the governments who've, who've either um, have adopted a feminist foreign policy or are planning to do, I really, really want to make a change. And in every government, there are really great people pushing for change. Um, so I think we rather focus on supporting them um, in, than, than instead of calling whether or not could be a fig leaf. Um, but what we also call for is really accountability so we always argue to be really specific and um, to, to lay out a, a clear plan of what a feminist foreign policy looks like in a specific instance how it can be implemented what funds are being um, secured for this and what's the time frame so that civil society can then also hold the government accountable um, and then on class inequality again in our understanding of feminist foreign policy focuses on everyone who's marginalized so not only women so a feminist foreign policy would also address class inequality 
And then there's a question on concrete steps on feminist foreign policy, and I don't have time to go into this, but we have on our website, um, there are two publications which I want to highlight. There's one which is called Feminist Responses to COVID, and one on the um, Feminist Manifesto for Germany. So Germany had general elections last year, and we basically laid out how a German feminist foreign policy could look like. Um, and obviously, this a lot of this is also applicable to other countries. So that could give an idea of the details of a feminist foreign policy. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dina. So we've come to our, uh, the end of our hour. We've had a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much uh, to our four uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Lots to chew on. Uh, there should be um, a recording of this available afterwards. So you can go back and, and I saw somebody uh, wanted Miriam to write down all of your hints. Um, uh, they put that in the chat. So you'll be able to watch it again and, uh, and hear more of her, more of her, um, her points about how to, how to proceed. But thank you very much uh, to, uh, to, to Nina, Judith, Miriam, and Sophia for joining us and to the audience uh, as well. Um, LSE Ideas is also running other events that you can find on their on their website. So shout out to uh, to LSE Ideas. Anyway, thank you very much for joining us. Bye bye. <laughs>